human beings are complicated animals, if you think about it. The long history of evolution has created a most interesting and challenging situation. It has made us very successful as a species in a certain sense, but it's also produced, evolution has, a complicated animal because we are deeply influenced by our emotions. We are deeply influenced by our instincts because we have the same instincts for self-preservation and for self-defense as all our cousins in the animal kingdom from which we arose. And we also have the thinking capacity, the ability to create ideas and theories and even the ability to create people like Einstein that created wonderful understandings of life, as do many scientists today. Great theoretical constructions. We also have the gift of imagination, the ability to create symphonies and music and poems and to imagine ourselves in another world in so many ways and imagine society being better than it is. We also are deeply influenced by other people. We are profoundly influenced by what other people think of us and how they see us in society. And we think very deeply about fitting into our niche and to the larger scheme of things. So just consider it that all of these influences are bearing upon us all the time. They come from us internally and externally. And so the question arises, how do we integrate these? How do we become a whole person, a stable person, amid all these influences? And that is where we get into the subject of what is called variously the path of life or the spiritual journey, because our lives, whether we like it or not, are journeys. And our journeys are all about acquiring wholeness and well-being, utilizing our internal diversity, our thinking, our feeling, our imagination, our instinct, somehow forging these into a whole and bringing them together so that we can live life to the fullest. That is the great quest of life. The great myths and fairy tales of history have sought to symbolically depict this dilemma and to pose some answers. And one of them, believe it or not, one of those great myths thought by many is the Wizard of Oz, which on one level is this whimsical fantasy that so obviously a creation of imagination and is in so many ways unreal, but underneath that it depicts a process, if you can think symbolically, of the parts of the self that I have just described, the thinking, the feeling, the intuition, the instinct, coming together as a whole so that we can find courage to live our lives. All of this is not an easy thing. It's easy to talk about, but not actually to, to do. The great Presbyterian minister, Reverend Frederick Buchner, who wrote many novels and books and is quite elderly now, I believe, but he studied literature deeply and he called The Wizard of Oz not only the greatest fairy tale that this nation has ever produced, but one of its greatest myths. How many people here have seen The Wizard of Oz? Well, doesn't that tell you something? How did that happen? Who has seen The Wizard of Oz more than once? Okay, so why is that? It was declared to be one of the 25 greatest films created by American cinema. Why? I think it was made in the 1930s. It still persists today. If you buy it, you've got to buy it on Amazon. They're not giving it away. It cost me $4. So it still has a commercial value, even to rent it. Think about that. Why? I mean, as a fanciful 
tale, what value could it be? It's just pure fantasy. But it is because there is something going on underneath the fantasy that makes it powerful. So I will tell the story and interpret it symbolically and try to introduce you to the gospel of the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy, a teenager, lives in a Kansas farm with her uncle Henry and Auntie M, and they are assisted by three farmhands. It's a boring life, a mundane life. Dorothy's dog, Toto, who will play a very important role throughout, bites a mean woman who's very wealthy. And then this mean, wealthy woman says, I, Dorothy, I'm going to take your dog and I'm going to have it put to death. And Dorothy is bitterly frightened and terrified by this because her dog is going to be euthanized. Well, Toto is taken away, but Toto escapes, something he does on many, many occasions. He's very, very uh, innovative, we shall find out. And returns to Dorothy, and Dorothy runs away for the sake of protecting her dog. Now let's think about the symbolism of the dog for a moment. I knew somebody in the Pacific Northwest who had a car tag which, which said, my God is spelled D-O-G. Dogs are incredibly important to the human beings. Scientists tell us that dogs have been human companions for 11,000 years. During the Great Recession of 2008, when people were had very few resources and people were going bankrupt and having all kinds of problems and no resources, the one thing that people in the United States did not cut back on was food and medical care and treat for their dogs. Think about it. The dog represents simplicity. And I apologize to all cat lovers. The, the dog represents simplicity, devotion, faithfulness, a kind of pure love. When I come home in the afternoon, my dog leaps with joy. Like, oh my God, you're finally here. Why is, you know, what can you, how, how much can you thank your dog for the feedback? <laughs> the dog is a being connected to us, but living utterly in harmony with its instincts, with its body, with reality. The story begins, you see, when there is a threat to the part of Dorothy that is represented by the dog. A natural instinct, the simplicity and innocence. So she runs away, and Professor Marvel, a fortune teller who prefigures the wizard, tells her to go home because Auntie M is heartbroken. Dorothy returns just as a tornado is coming. She takes refuge in the house. While there, something hits her. She's knocked out. Storms, especially tornadoes, always symbolize inner turmoil. So the very idea that this part of her, this innocence, this naturalness might be threatened is overwhelming and a storm begins to happen. And then the fantastic journey begins. The tornado in this dreamlike sequence takes the house and drops it in an unknown land. Dorothy awakens and is greeted by a group of short people named Munchkins one of my favorite characters, and by the good witch named Glinda, who explains to Dorothy that she is in Munchkin land, in the land of Oz. The Munchkins symbolize all within us, all of our physical processes and everything in us that 
supports our health and well-being. They happily sing, ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. The good witch Glinda is that part of ourselves that is composed of positive emotions, positive mind states, such as compassion, empathy, gratitude, and hope. It is a part of us all the time, but like the good witch Glinda, is not always pleasant present in our lives. However, of course, something comes to disturb this. The wicked witch of the West appears in a puff of smoke, the sister of the deceased wicked witch. Now, the wicked witch symbolizes negativity, despair, resentment that is also a part of us which generates a constant desire to bring others down into our misery. And that's what the wicked witch does continually, tries to bring, to destroy the happiness of others. And there's a part of us that's like that, that can be lost in self-pity and despair and blaming and hatred and anger. And that can be like a flame that just engulfs everything. Well, the wicked witch tries to still or seize her deceased sister's ruby slippers, but Glinda magically transports them onto Dorothy's feet and tells her whatever happens to make sure those shoes stay on her feet. The red slippers represent our precious connection to the earth, to reality, to what can ground us, to what is true and real and enduring, and for that reason, is precious. Now, <clears throat> the wicked witch is banished and leaves because she does not have power in this place. But Dorothy wants to go back to her home. And Glinda tells her that that's possible. But she must go see the Wizard of Oz to be able to do that. Now, Glinda knows that she is giving false information. Because she knows that the Wizard of Oz is not really what he appears to be, that he is a persona of greatness that's just human behind that projection. But Glinda gives her hope, and that hope is what Dorothy needs to continue on the journey. Dorothy is directed to follow the yellow brick road that will take her to Emerald City. The road yellow, is yellow, and yellow and gold is the symbol of wholeness, of oneness. Emerald is the color green, which symbolizes life, rebirth, and the renewal of life. She is on the road to wholeness, and her destination is rebirth and renewal. This is Dorothy's journey of awakening. As she begins her journey, she encounters three characters in sequence, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion. The Scarecrow wants a brain, the Tin Man wants a heart, and the Cowardly Lion wants courage. Each of these characters represents something that we all need to be complete and to be whole. We need an active capacity to think, we need the active capacity to feel, and we need courage to live. And if any of them are missing, we are incomplete. They reach the Emerald City, and Dorothy is becoming better able to stand up for herself, to focus her forces along with her companions, to face the challenges before her. She is initially denied an audience with the wizard, 
but the four are finally admitted into the wizard's chambers. The wizard appears in this vast, frightening, impressive array of smoke and light and sound and overwhelming presence. The wizard represents the human tendency to project perfection and greatness on some political or religious or financial hero, someone who's above the mundane, who's better and more important than us, and who we should therefore worship and see as greater than us. And this, of course, permeates society, and we're all familiar with the political forms of that. Dorothy is still living under the spell of her projections reflected by this wondrous awe, this fearfulness they have toward the wizard. Now, the wizard tells them that he will grant their wishes if they do one thing, which is to go get the wicked witch's broom. The broomstick represents the power of the wicked witch to maneuver, to control, to frighten, to intimidate others. It seems like a hopeless quest, but they do it, and it shows that Dorothy has increased her wholeness because now she's able to face challenges and say, yes, I will do something. Dorothy is captured by flying monkeys and taken to the Wicked Witch, but the ruby slippers protect her. Her contact with reality, her grounding in fact, her remaining in touch with the earth and her body and what is real. The Wicked Witch again threatens Toto and captures him and puts him in a box. But Toto, once again, is very resourceful and escapes the power of the dog. <laughs> Toto goes to the scarecrow, the tin man, the cowardly lion, and invites them to go free Dorothy. And they go. And they're ambivalent and they're reluctant and they're fearful and so forth. But they now have been empowered because now they approach that which they formerly would fear greatly. Dorothy's companions are now taking the initiative, but once again they are captured by the witch and her guards, and they struggle against capture, but are finally cornered. The wicked witch declares that she is going to destroy Dorothy, but first all of her companions, one by one. And so she lights a fire of the scarecrow. And Dorothy, trying to put out the fire, accidentally throws water on the wicked witch, which causes her unexpectedly by all to melt away. Water has been an incredibly important symbol for thousands of years. Taoism, which is a very ancient religion, equated water with the divine. Water symbols are the chief element in many spiritual traditions and rituals and reflect rejuvenation and healing. In Jungian psychology, water is a symbol of life and the vast unconscious, the unconscious forces of life. In Christianity, people who are baptized by water are thereby given literally new life. So water represents the force of nature and life. With the wicked witch dead, the witch's guards immediately, immediately switch allegiance. They change size. You see, once the wicked witch in us is put aside or dissolved, we suddenly find we have a lot more energy 
available to do the things that matter most and to go in one direction. The four return to the wizard, but he tells them to return tomorrow because he knows he does not have the powers that he has projected, that he has gotten others to imagine he has. But once again, Toto plays a key role. Toto tips over to the curtain and pushes it aside. And there the Wizard of Oz is seen in all of his common humanity. Dorothy confronts him and says, Who are you? And he admits, I am only a man. And Dorothy says, But you are a bad man. And he says, No, I am a good man, but a bad wizard. The wizard represents that part of ourselves and others who would inflate our value and make ourselves something special vis-a-vis -vis others. And it is the force that maintains the power in many churches in this land. Many religious and political groups have people who are able to project the right amount of charisma so that others get to believe or are provoked because of human frailty, are provoked to believe, wow, you're great. I'll follow you. But everybody, everybody is only human. Dorothy learns that what she thought was so exalted is in fact something as ordinary as herself. She is slowly learning to rediscover the ordinary. He then grants, the wizard does, the things that the three friends of Dorothy had asked for, but he does so uh, in a whimsical, lighthearted way by giving them a token that represents what they said they need, but he reminds them that what they wanted was always something that was available to them. And this too reveals something important about ourselves. We are continually projecting power and majesty and importance to something outside of ourselves, not realizing that we're projecting what is really part of us. And that it is our limiting beliefs about ourselves. It is a belief in our own valuelessness that keeps us from possessing what we see in others and we think others must give us or we won't be able to receive it. The Wizard of Oz offers Dorothy uh, to take Dorothy back to uh, Kansas and he offers her and her companions a, uh, a balloon. And he invites everybody to get in, and everybody does, including Dorothy and Toto. But Toto, once again, saves the day. Because Toto jumps out, and Dorothy follows him. And the wizard goes up into the clouds of imagination, away from the earth, and saves Dorothy from a similar fate. Dorothy is in despair wanting to go back to Kansas and not knowing how, Glinda then reappears and tells Dorothy she always had the power to return to Kansas with the help of the ruby slippers. But she says you had to find that out for yourself. You see, we never really listen to things like sermons and preachers and teachers and, and things people say to us, we only really learn from what we actually experience. And Glenda knew that. Dorothy says goodbye tearfully to her companions with great sadness and with Toto in her arms. She says, I am ready. Glenda 
tells her to say the magic words, there's no place like home, and she is transported back to Kansas, the most mundane place on earth. She awakens in her bed with a cloth on her injured head and attended by her aunt and family. Professor Marvel uh, is there too. Dorothy describes what she has gone through, but nobody believes her. You see, nobody will ever believe the importance of our inner journey. They'll say, oh, it doesn't make sense. It's not part of my life. Only the person must believe in their own inner journey and let go of trying to explain it to others. And only in that way will they really seize it. They think she has imagined it. But Dorothy has been wounded in the head and bandages on her head, which shows that the spiritual journey involves being wounded and somehow recovering from that wound or wounds. Dorothy gratefully proclaims there's no place like home. We go on journeys to exotic places. We try to get to know exotic people in the effort to find something to fix and prove and transform us, to give us a life that we think we need but is out of reach. But yet, as Dorothy points out, it's always to be found at home, the place where we find family and friends and community present, wherever or however that might be. And it is there, and really only there, which is the best place to learn to be our true self. The story shows that we all need a heart, a brain, and courage, a solid connection to reality, and to be home. It also suggests, which I think is true, that just when we need it, support will show up in some most unexpected places to help us, provided we are open. And so, along with T.S. Eliot's poem, I think Dorothy could say at the end of her journey, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the very first time. And now, mignon. <laughs>